The bulls are back in town. Wall Street set to open higher after Greece's parliament votes in favor of a new debt deal aimed at keeping the country in the eurozone. We've got the latest on that. Plus, the hits just keep on coming for Netflix as the streaming video provider sees its subscriber base soar. We'll look at how it plans to keep up the momentum. And is Uber over for California officials? We'll tell you about the latest flap between the Golden State and the hot ride sharing service. Hey everyone, I'm Lauren Lister of Yahoo Finance, coming to you live from the NASDAQ market side in Times Square. Some stocks you'll want to watch today coming up in a moment. But first, uh, look at what's set to move markets this morning. After taking a breather yesterday, investor, investors seem ready to jump back into stocks. Futures are higher following Wednesday's slightly down session, which snapped a four-day winning streak on Wall Street. Today, investors are focusing again on Greece after the parliament there agreed to terms of that new bailout plan and a second day of congressional testimony by Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen. Yesterday, she reiterated the Fed's plan to raise interest rates likely sometime this year. Yahoo Finance senior columnist Mike Santoli is live in our studios with more Mike. The Greek parliament bit the bullet. They agreed to these new austerity measures and other European leaders appear ready to help out Athens with more loans. Investors seem to like it. Are we ready to put Greece in our rearview mirror for now at least? You know, for now, I think that's the key. I think yesterday you had a little bit of a late day sell off as the images were on TV of some protests in Greece. Just a little bit of last minute doubt that this would finally go through. The vote in the end was not close at all. And I do think investors are very eager to look beyond uh, not just Greece, but in general, these kind of macro risks. European stocks are rallying on the Greece news. The euro continues to decline. This is part of the same dynamic uh, that really took hold earlier in the year. And I do think that U.S. stocks can be a beneficiary though they were acting a little bit tired yesterday after that four-day climb. All right, what else is going to be driving stocks today? Honestly, some big names in the NASDAQ, I think, are, are key. Uh, after the close. All behind me. Intel, we'll get to them. <laughs> exactly. Intel, Netflix, all the rest of that. Also, Goldman Sachs this morning might actually get some attention, too. Seems like a little bit of a miss on their numbers. And that's been a hot stock lately. All right, quickly, the government is out with the latest read on the job market. What do we have with jobless claims today? A solid number, 281,000 new claims, slightly below expectations. So really nothing to change the story of a tightening labor market. All right, thanks, Mike. We'll check in with you in a couple minutes. And let's take a look at overseas markets this morning. All right, here are some of the stocks the Yahoo Finance team will be watching for you today as the earnings parade continues. There's some of those NASDAQ names that Mike mentioned. We begin with Intel, shares up close to 2.5% ahead of the bell. The world's largest chip maker blew the doors off second quarter profit and sales estimates. Intel says it benefited from growth in its data centers and the Internet of Things businesses. Those helped offset weak demand for PCs. Sticking with uh, Dow members, United Health Group shares are on the move this morning. As with Intel, the health insurance provider beat estimates on both the top and bottom lines. United Health says its results were boosted by increased enrollments and revenue gains in its Optum Technology Unit. In addition, it's raising its full year profit and sales forecasts. Shares of United Health Group are up 25% this year. Another Dow component on our watch list is Goldman Sachs. Shares are falling this morning. The investment bank also beat on earnings and revenue. However, much of the profit came because of excluded items related to payments Goldman made to settle government lawsuits. Revenue was helped by its investment banking section. Shares of Goldman Sachs are up 9.5% this year. Now we shift to Citigroup. Shares are up in the pre-market. Unlike Goldman, Citi is benefiting from fewer litigation costs, helping it score a strong second quarter earnings report. The third largest U.S. bank was also helped by restructuring and cost-cutting measures. Shares of Citigroup are up 4% since the start of the year. We are following eBay up over 3% this morning in early going. The online auction site second quarter profit topped estimates, but revenue did fall short. eBay is also announcing another $1 billion stock buyback. The company is splitting with its PayPal payment division. That happens tomorrow. And reports say it is set to sell its enterprise unit. Shares of eBay are up almost 13% in 2015. And we are watching shares of Netflix soar this morning, up over 12%. The streaming video service with hits like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black is adding subscribers even faster than it had forecast. 
Netflix says its subscriber base jumped by 3.3 million in the second quarter with especially strong demand overseas. It also reported earnings of six cents a share better than analysts had forecast while revenue was pretty much in line. Shares of Netflix have been the top performer in the S&P 500 this year and just adding to those gains this morning. So let's check in with Mike Santoli again and let's just keep on this conversation about Netflix. Mike, first, your reaction to the subscriber growth. Yeah, the story continues to play out in terms of subscriber ads across the world, pretty much the way Reed Hastings, the CEO, has laid it out there and have inv his investors have really priced into the, the stock. You know, their overall results were not significantly better than the guidance they put out there just three months earlier, except for the net new subscriber additions, which mm -hmm. was about 30 percent better than expected. That's the whole story right now. Nobody really cares about how much money they're committing to new uh, content and the fact that they really are, are still significantly negative cash cash flow uh, on an operating mm. basis. All right, well, let's just go through a few of the highlights from the earnings call. The company has no plans to raise prices yet. It does have plans to double down on the original content so that Netflix can get like HBO before HBO gets like Netflix, as they like to say. The strategy does seem to be working. Can Netflix afford to keep creating original content? You mentioned that cash flow. They can afford it as long as the market allows them to and, and believes in that strategy. I think they can. I also think it, it reflects a recognition that a lot of these streaming services are going to look incredibly similar. They're going to have basically the same content, this rotating cast of um, old movies and TV series and all that. I do think that Netflix feels, therefore, it has to distinguish itself on the original side, especially when you're trying to keep new membership momentum uh, moving. It's not just like as if people can just choose generically between Netflix, Amazon, on or some other b bundle from the cable company. But what about as more people get into original content? You know, Amazon just announced its first original film with Spike Lee. How much room is there for content? There's room in the sense of just having something that's yours alone. It's really about exclusivity, not necessarily about how many Emmy Awards you get or anything like that. And obviously, look, it's going to be a matter of is the show good enough, popular enough to cross that threshold where you decide you have to have a given service. And I think right now people are happy to have more than one if there's a must-see series on one of them or another. Yeah, because Prime and the monthly subscription for Netflix, they're all really pretty reasonable exactly. when you they're look at the price yeah. points. Yeah. And, you know, really interesting, CEO Reed Hastings also voiced support for the merger between Charter Communications and Time Warner Cable. This is noteworthy because there was that very public showdown that Netflix had with the Comcast last year over streaming and whether content providers should have to pay more for streaming space. Is this a smart move by Hastings now to support that merger? Sure, because you got a commitment from Charter to say that they will not charge a premium to keep that signal strong, which is really what he was complaining about with regard to Comcast. So he's basically saying, look, as long as everybody is on an even playing field and we don't have to necessarily uh, just sort of be extorted in his terms uh, for more money to keep our stream solid, then yes, I do think it's smart for him to do that. He should be agnostic, really, as to who the provider is that gets the broadband service that get hit, gets his service into homes. Yeah, as long as they get it there fast. Yeah. Let's turn to U.S. tech companies dealing with overseas business. European Union regulators now have U.S. chip giant Qualcomm in their sights. They're investigating the company for possible predatory pricing as well as offering discounts to customers for buying Qualcomm products exclusively. Mike, how much trouble is this for Qualcomm? Well, it seems like an ongoing nuisance that probably has been escalated now that it's a sort of an official inquiry here. Uh, there's been some disputes with competitors in Europe. They've had complaints lodged about them using Qualcomm, using its market power to try and sell other services. And, you know, underpricing your stuff in a predatory way is a no-no across the board. Uh, but it does show, of course, that the EU uh, does like to look at these dominant U.S. tech companies and try to see if they've misused their market power. It's one of these things that, you know, kind of you don't know where the line is between a natural uh, monopoly or dominant uh, tech company and something where basically people have done something to manipulate their market position. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is with these U.S. tech companies, a number of them have been targeted by EU regulators, Google, Amazon, Intel. Those are all companies that have had unwanted attention over in the EU. What does this mean for U.S. companies doing business in Europe? 
I think it really does go in the category of, you know, one more headache and cost of doing business, but not something that really changes the competitive picture in a lasting way. Uh, this all happens usually after these companies have been there a while and have a strong market position. And in fact, of course, we know even when it's come down to a fine or some kind of uh, finding against the company, the financial obligations, the fines are not that high. So it's much more, I think, about uh, an unfriendly market environment, but not one that's going to keep anybody out. Speaking of fines, the state of California is ordering Uber to pay a $7.3 million fine for refusing to tell the state how many ride requests it receives and also refusing to hand over some other data. Mike, the company claims the data would violate the privacy of riders and drivers and Uber plans to appeal. What gives here? You know, if you look at the details, it really does seem like a bureaucratic tussle. You have this regulatory agency that's demanding information of a class of companies that haven't existed for very long. Uber's pushing back against all that they want to uh, necessarily, you know, have handed over. I don't think that the basics of this actual dispute are that serious, but it does show Uber's general challenge, which is, of course, to try to penetrate these very entrenched interests, whether it's regulatory or the regulated taxi services. So to me, it's a it's kind of an aggressive, arguably belligerent company going up against uh, kind of an immovable regulatory structure in, uh, in California. Yeah, because Lyft an Uber competitor handed that info right over. Now, Uber has also become a hot topic in the presidential campaign, if you can believe it. You know, Jeb Bush will be in San Francisco tomorrow. He plans to use Uber. Hillary Clinton this week criticized the company for not providing benefits for drivers. Why is Uber a political football? I think because it's gotten so big so fast and it touches on so many of these longstanding issues out there, whether it's, you know, innovation, the Silicon Valley economy, the power to kind of, you know, upend markets, but also the anxiety of, of workers and, and yeah. kind of what, what labor deserves out of all this innovation. And therefore, there's almost something for every politician to seize on when it comes to this company. All right. I think that one thing we can bet on for sure is we will continue to hear about Uber and talk about Uber a lot in sure. the months and probably years to come. Mike Santoli, thank you. And thank you so much for watching. That wraps up Market Movers. I'm Yahoo Finance's Lauren Lister. See you tomorrow.